I'd like to go ahead and get started um, and introduce our speaker. I'm very happy to have Marshall Tanik back with us today to talk about basketball law. Some of you might have been here before when he talked to us about hockey law. Um, so very happy to have him back. Um, Mr. Tanik is a shareholder with the firm of Meyer, News and Tanik. In addition to his law practice, he's an avid historian and educator on constitutional law and history. Please help me welcome Marshall Tanik. Well, thank you very much, Liz. It's a pleasure to be back here. Some of you may recall, it was about to, I think it was exactly one year ago today, that uh, I gave a presentation on um, Frozen, that we had the Frozen Four in the Twin Cities here at Excel Center, and uh, I did one on hockey law. Were any of you here on that one? Heard that one? And you actually came back for this one? Okay. All right, well, this is basketball law. We all know why we're here. Uh, Final Four in town starting on Saturday. A lot of activities going on, obviously, now. In fact, I flew in. I was out of town. I flew in last night, kind of late at night, um, and landed at the, the airport. Uh, and uh, I thought there'd be a lot of sort of maybe some Final Four hoopla and stuff. And it was this usual desolatory um, Twin Cities Airport at 10 o'clock. So I guess they're waiting for their crush of people to come in a little bit later in the week. Although I don't know, I, I, I just read that each school gets like, was it 400 tickets is assigned to each school? So it's not like they're gonna have hordes of, it isn't quite like the Super Bowl where I think we're gonna have hordes descending here. I mean, it's, it's a big event, national event, international event, and we'll have our usual you know, crowd from outside the, the state. But I think a lot of the people are gonna be from around this area attending, which is great. Uh, incidentally, if you enjoy this, come back in about three years. The women's final four is here in 2022. So uh, I may wrap this up and try again if I'm still around, and I hope some of you are in 2022. Watch for that. Um, all right, we're here in final four week, and the subject of my discussion today is from the courts to the courts. Catchy title. I hope the presentation matches up with the title. Um, how many of you have done your brackets here? Uh, everyone do a bracket? Everyone in their brackets? Thanks, Blue Devils. <laughs> and other teams. Well, I got Texas Tech in the five. I still got Texas Tech, but uh, I missed every other game. I think I missed 63 games, but I got Texas Tech yet still in there. So they're still alive. All right. Uh, we're going to start by talking about a non college basketball uh, case. But a one, and what I do in these presentations is I take a number of cases with the, dealing with the subject matter and try to show how they apply or relate to or sometimes modify existing legal doctrines and how these other doctrines from these cases run through other disciplines in the law. Um, this uh, will be the 30th year, this is the conclusion of the 30th year of the Timberwolves, who've also had a rather dreadful uh, existence for the last three decades. So we're coming up on Timberwolves 30 here, and yet again, they're going to miss the playoffs. But one of the, uh, but the in, in honor of the 30th anniversary of the Timberwolves here in, in Minnesota, uh, I thought I'd start by talking about an, a, a, a case that gave rise to the site where the Timberwolves now play at the Target Center. And that will be with the facility where the women's final four is played in three years. They're not playing in the in the U.S. Bank Stadium, not quite enough, big enough crowd. They'll be playing at the Target Center, where they were before 1995, when the uh, last time the women's final four was here. The case uh, uh, that uh, established, if you will, the uh, the right of the Timberwolves to play where they play is this case. It's an unpublished case by the Minnesota Court of Appeals, Wong Kong Har Wan Soon Association versus Chin. Go back about 30 plus years in your time machine to the mid. 1980s, actually about 1987, when the Timberwolves get their franchise here from the NBA, um, uh, as it's the professor of source of Minneapolis Lakers, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, the Timberwolves, as you may recall, uh, played their first season in the old Metrodome, for, because the, the new facility wasn't built yet. They played in the Metrodome and set an all-time attendance record at, uh, at the Metrodome, which would seat a lot more people. But they wanted to play, of course, where they're playing now in what is now known as the Target Center. Um, that area back in those days was the warehouse district had been developing in the 80s, but it was still kind of an older industrial warehouse area. Some remnants of the farmer's market, which are across the road there, were still existing there. And there's a lot of old ramshackle buildings that were basically serving the farmer's market and warehouse trade of the day back in the 1980s. The, um, 
um, the, the twins wanted the twins, the, uh, the Timberwolves wanted that site to build their, their facility. The problem was that there was a tenant who had a three year lease at that site. There was a building there and, um, and a tenant was in that building and a tenant the tenant in this case wanted to remain in that site because he had a three-year lease. Well, the landlord wanted to evict the tenant from that building so they could tear down the building, sell it to the Timberwolves, so the, the land of the Timberwolves and the Timberwolves would build the stadium there, and then not the stadium, but the arena there. Okay? The only problem was this tenant had a three-year lease. So we have a landlord with a significant economic interest, and the Timberwolves is a non-party with a significant economic interest in the NBA too, in wanting that site. The only uh, rub in the ointment there was the tenant had a long-term lease and had, had three years left to run. Okay? Meanwhile, the landlord, notwithstanding the three-year tenant's lease, gives the Timberwolves an option to purchase the property. The tenant wasn't real pleased with that because the tenant wanted to stay in that three, wanted to stay where the tenant was with the three-year lease. The, 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 the uh, Timberwolves exercised their option to buy that property, the property where the Target Center now stands, and the landlord served an eviction notice on the tenant who still had a lease there. Okay. The tenant refused to move. The landlord brought an unlawful detainer proceeding, okay, a rather routine unlawful detainer proceeding in the uh, Hennepin County Housing Court. The tenant thought the hearing was going to be at the Ridgedale Courthouse rather than the downtown courthouse. The tenant had been at one other legal proceeding and he thought, and thought that was where they had the, the proceeding. So the tenant did, failed to appear on time at the government center in downtown Minneapolis. And by the time the tenant got word, you're in the wrong place, you got to go downtown. The tenant got there, but the tenant was about an hour late. Well, too late. Judge in the UD proceeding, the unlawful detainer proceeding, enters a default judgment against the tenant. Case over, not quite. Tenant late for court, judge says can't be late for court, we all know that, default proceeding. The tenant appeals that to the Minnesota Court of Appeals and tries to reopen the judgment. Something that, you, this, that occurs from time to time when there's a, oftentimes it's a connection with a default, sometimes it's a connection with newly discovered evidence or other provisions under Rule 66, but in this case, the tenant was seeking to reopen a default judgment. Now, this is an unpublished case, but it draws upon a, a fairly long body of Minnesota uh, law, Supreme Court and Appellate Court law, with respect to the four factors to reopen a default judgment. And the four factors, not just as in this case, but in other, other cases, consist of does the claimant, the party seeking to reopen a judgment under Rule 60, I said 66, and at Rule 60, can, can the claimant seeking to reopen a judgment, particularly a default judgment, establish or satisfy these four standards? One standard is, does the tenant have a reasonable defense on the merits? Court said, yeah, looks like he does. He has a lease here. Second uh, standard or prong of a reopening of a case is, does there a reasonable excuse for the default? Of course, said, yeah, it was. The tenant went to the wrong building, but it's not like he did. It's not as though the tenant um, ignored the proceeding or, uh, or, 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 or just was contumacious. He just made a mistake as being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So that was a reasonable excuse. Did the tenant act with due diligence? Yes, he did. The tenant brought a legal proceeding immediately to try to reopen the judgment. And was there any prejudice to the other party? Well, a party who prevails in a default always has some prejudice because they won. And that means they have to go over and start again. But in this case, the court said, well, that kind of prejudice isn't enough. It has to be some real economic hardship, usually some reliance. For instance, had the Timberwolves already started building on the premises or something like that, but that didn't happen here. There was no, there was no hardship other than the fact that the landlord would have to defend the case. So the court applying those four factors as it re, uh, allowed the case to be reopened, remanded the case for further, reversed and remanded for further proceedings. The upshot was there weren't any further proceedings. The Timberwolves decided we can't wait around for the legal process to uh, evolve here. Uh, and so we're just gonna buy the property, raise the building and buy out the tenant. And that's what happened. And that's how the Target Center got built. So the next time you're there at an event at the Target Center or uh, driving by there or just thinking about it, it's this case that established that building. Timberwolves succeeded sort of the Minneapolis Lakers. There's probably no one in this room except me who remembers 
personally the Minneapolis Lakers, but the Minneapolis Lakers were the professional basketball team that was here in the 40s, 50s, and into 1960. Now, back in those days, basketball was a popular sport, but the NBA, as most of you know, was nothing like it is today. There were eight teams, nine teams, 10 teams. It was almost a, 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 a kind of an industrial league. The, the, the teams were in cities like Fort Wayne, the Fort Wayne Pistons, the C Rochester, New York Royals, the Syracuse Nationals, New York was in the league. Um, there was a Chicago team that faltered. Uh, Milwaukee had a team, the Atlanta Hawks were the Milwaukee Hawks back then. So it was largely confined to the upper Midwest and East Coast. And um, there were eight or nine teams and they didn't, have, it, it was, just wasn't the national event that it is. I mean, the, the national sport that it is now. The Lakers, as you know, were dominant as the professional team. And that was the only professional team Minnesota had back then. No Twins, no Vikings, no Wild, uh, uh, no Lynx. Um, so um, they were, they were our, they were the, at least the, the, the Twin Cities and Minnesota's mark on the sports uh, map, at least professional sports map, although it was a second or third page of story nevertheless, because it wasn't, a, it wasn't really the kind of major sport it is now. The Lakers were very successful. They won five championships during that era, late 40s, early 19, through the mid 1950s. They were the dominant team of their era. They were sort of like the New York Yankees, the Boston Celtics later, um, New England Patriots. They were, the, they were the premier team, largely because, well, they had a number of good players, but largely because of one key player, George Mikan, who was old number 99, voted player of the half century. He was a dominant player. He was the LeBron James, Will Chamberlain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar of his day. He had a very good supporting cast, including a number of Minnesota bred, born and bred players, like Vern Nicholson in the Hall of Fame from Hamlin University and others. But the team uh, centered around George Mikan. In 1960, the, tw the, uh, the, the team had faltered in the late 1950s, uh, both on the court after Mikan retired and at, uh, at the box office. The, that, uh, the, uh, the Lakers were largely confined to playing at the old Minneapolis Armory, which still exists. And they're having an event there this week in connection to the Final Four. They have music events and like that. That was the home of the Minneapolis Lakers. It seated about 5,000. It was about the same shape back then as it is now, although it's been re renovated. It was not a good facility. They played a few games at the old convention center, which is now where the new convention center is, but it, it, it didn't seat many people. Um, it was not the kind of, it didn't have suites and all the stuff that we expect today. And there was difficulty booking dates. Um, the circus came to town and the auto show, this time of year in the spring, it was the auto show and the circus and, circus and other things. And they couldn't, the, the Lakers couldn't get dates for those buildings. They didn't own those buildings. So when the playoffs came around, and this is NBA playoff time, they were confined to playing wherever they could. I, as a youth, remember going to a Minneapolis Lakers playoff game against the Boston Celtics with Bill Russell and Bob Cousy, story team, Red Auerbach. I remember going to see one of these later playoff games, which they lost, at, at Norton Fieldhouse. Anyone know where Norton Fieldhouse is? Well, it's at Hamlin University. It's, you know, it's a little, it's a basically a, nothing about Hamlin, but there is a, it's a you know, 1,500-seat uh, field house that looks like an old high school gymnasium. They couldn't get dates. Plus, Los Angeles was beckoning. The Dodgers had just recently moved out to Los Angeles, 1958, and the Giants, and baseball was expanding to the West Coast, and because of air, because of jet airplanes and the like, the West Coast and, and population growth and television, the West Coast was now in play, whereas there were no professionals, very few professional sports teams west of the Mississippi until then, a couple of them, San Francisco 49ers, but Los Angeles, obviously, with its wealth and population growth and television market and the like, uh, was a much more attractive area than Minnesota. So the Lakers moved. Bob Short was the owner of the Lakers at the time, and he caught a lot of calumny for moving the Lakers. This was an era when not a lot of teams moved from one place to the other. Um, there was a minority shareholder lawsuit brought by, uh, against the majority owner, Mr. Short, who wanted to move the Lakers. And that case was litigated under the, in the title Short versus Minneapolis Basketball Company, I'm sorry, Scotts versus Minnesota Basketball Company. The issue in the case was access to corporate records, but it basically was a, a, an early version of a minority buyout case, a minority shareholder case. There were a number of other issues, but the case turned largely on what are the rights of a minority shareholder in objecting to a move that at least the majority minority shareholder maintained would impair 
the minority shareholders' economic interest. Well, the minority shareholders didn't get much traction, couldn't get the case, uh, couldn't get the case heard before the Lakers moved, and by that time it was too late. Lakers had moved, and the case kind of petered out. But it was an early version of what we see today as a minority shareholder buyout or freeze out case. And uh, it was the predecessor for the Lakers. It, it was it was not the predecessor, but it didn't prevent the Lakers from moving nonetheless. The Lakers moved out to Los Angeles, um, and in their very first draft, they drafted a player named Jerry West, who is the person who was the prototype for the logo and the NBA uh, logos. And uh, he led them to uh, a numerous championships, uh, both a divisional and one world championship along. And then the next generation of Lakers was with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Magic Johnson and, uh, yeah, and then Kobe Bryant and, and Sha Shaquille O'Neal. And now we have the LeBron James era, such as it is. But that's the story of the Lakers started here moved out to Los Angeles. There were a number, of, the Lakers were succeeded by another professional basketball team that probably very few remember. There was another league that popped up in the mid 1960s in professional basketball. And that's because television was obviously catching on to basketball. Basketball is a great game to televise, a fine place, and easy to televise. Um, and basketball is becoming more popular by the mid 1960s. It's always popular at the college level, but professional basketball is becoming more popular and they were getting into cities with bigger populations. And the NBA was expanding. So uh, basketball, uh, so another competing league popped up called the ABA, American Basketball Association, which was most memorable for what? If anyone remembers them. They had the three color ball, right? The red, white, and blue ball. And that was, they were kind of like the AFL in football. American Football League grows up to challenge the National Football League also as a merger. The ABA was a version of that. It was a secondary league, but they competed for players. And they competed hard for key players trying to, trying to get the you know, popularity. Uh, and, and they were kind of, again, in secondary markets by and large, because the NBA by that time had many of the larger markets. Minneapolis was right for a team because the Lakers had left. So the so the, the, the new team came here from the Minnesota Muskies. They played out at the Met Center, yet another arena that no longer exists. The old Met Center where the North Stars played out, where the Mall of America now is, or the parking lot of the Mall of America. Um, and they came here in the A as part of the ABA. Among other things, so the ABA didn't only not only invented the three-color ball, but uh, they invented a couple other changes, or rule changes, the three-point play, the three-point shot was instituted by the ABA. No one ever thought of that one before. The ABA had the three-point shot and some other rule changes, most of which have been incorporated in, in high school, college, and professional basketball these days. So the ABA was kind of a forerunner. They had a, they had a team here, and the main case that involved the, there are a number of um, Musk, Minnesota Muskies cases, and there was also a successor team to the Muskies, but the main case that of particular local interest, and there was a local case, was a case called Muskies versus Hudson. The Hudson was Lou Hudson. Lou Hudson was a star All-American basketball player on the Minnesota Gophers in the early 1960s. He was one of, he, he was one of three of the first African-American basketball players at Minnesota and one of the very early African-American basketball players in the Big Ten, although there were other Afri the previous African-American basketball players in the Big Ten, but Minnesota never had one, had a basketball player, an African-American basketball player. He was recruited here along with two other um, African-American players, and Hudson was the best of those, although there were some other good players. Hudson was an All-American, led the team to some significant successes in the early 60s, and when he, when his eligibility ran out, he was primed to play pro basketball, and he signed a contract with the St. Louis Hawks, that's the team that's now in Atlanta, which initially started in Milwaukee. They were the Hawks in Milwaukee. They moved to St. Louis, and then they moved to Atlanta. But so Hudson was drafted by and signed by the St. Louis Hawks. Okay? But the Muskies weren't content with that, and they knew that Hudson would be a real good box office draw here because of his local ties as a, a great Minnesota basketball player. So they signed him. So Hudson had two contracts. Hard enough for some players, he had one contract, but he had two contracts. He had a contract with the NBA team that the older established NBA team, and he signed a contract with the Muskies. Well, meanwhile, the St. Louis team moves to Atlanta, so there's a question of whether Hudson's contract gets transferred to Atlanta, so he signs a third contract with the Atlanta franchise. So Hudson had three contracts, so I guess you could call that an early version of a three-point play. Um, 
And so the issue in the case was who gets to, who does he have to, who, who gets Hudson or put it another way, who, who can Hudson play for? The contract with the Muskies was provided for more money, probably less stability because it wasn't a stable league. Um, but uh, Hudson had, H Hudson signed a big contract back in those days. It was a five-year contract for the extravagant sum of $34,000 a year, which is approximately what LeBron James makes in about one quarter and probably what Zion Williams was making about a, you know, during the warm-ups of his first pro game. Okay. But that was big money back then. And so the issue was, this was an injunctive case. It's a, it's a non-compete type case. It wasn't, there wasn't a non-compete contract, but it arises in the context of competing employers wanting to employ the same employee. Most non-compete cases are about, usually involve two employers, but usually one employer wants to hire someone who the other employer doesn't want that employer to hire. But in this case, we have two or three employers all fighting for the services of one employee. And the employee, Hudson, basically wants to go to the employer that gives him the best deal. And they were throwing all kinds of good deals at him. And the issue was, can they, would there be an injunction or not? The Muskies sought an injunction to prevent Hudson from playing with the NBA team. Ultimately, the court ruled against the Muskies team on grounds of unclean hands. Again, a familiar legal doctrine to all of us in this room, not so familiar perhaps with lay people. Unclean hands sounds, sounds rather sordid, but the court ruled that you, you, the Muskies could not um, uh, sign Hudson because he already had a contract. And they were devious and unfair and manipulative in trying to get him to break that contract. Uh, so Hudson could not play for the Muskies, couldn't uh, cash in, if you will, on the larger contract that the Muskies offered him. Although in the long run, it probably proved to be uh, worthwhile for Hudson because the Muskies collapsed after a year anyway. Uh, and he ended up playing in the NBA and had a very good all-star career for a number of years in the NBA, uh, largely with the Atlanta Hawks. But the, the principle of the case was that uh, injunctive relief will not be granted for conduct that is tainted with unfairness and injustice, basically poaching someone else who has a, a pay, poaching an employee who has a contract with another employee, it's a form of tortious interference with contract as well. There are some other musky cases, but in the, in, in, the, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip over them, but I just want to touch upon a few of those cases. Let me move now to the college level of basketball law and some college cases. Um, let me start with a case that what didn't, didn't take place at the high level of intercollegiate basketball, but took place here in the University of Minnesota. The case is Mueller versus Board of Regents. That's Mueller, not Mueller. Mueller, not related. Uh, and uh, this involved the person who was the director of the intramural sports program at the University of Minnesota. And Minnesota has had and still has a, a, a robust intramural uh, a, athletic activities. Uh, basketball was uh, very well organized back then. I don't know what it's like now, but um, and they had leagues and teams from different dormitories and schools and colleges at the intramural level. Although many of the uh, many of the players who played in them was mainly, I think, men. I don't think there was any women's. In, well, there may have been a little bit of women's intramural basketball. It's mainly men, and they were pretty good players. They weren't at the D Division One college level, but most of them had played at a fairly high level in high school. Not all, but this was intramural basketball and intramural sports. And um, the director was found to, was terminated for a prolonged misusing, for prolonged, as the court said, misuse of personnel and resources because he ran a summer camp. And his, in his summer camp, though, he ran it out of his university office without approval from the university. He used the university logo, he used university stationery, he used university personnel to assist him in his private engagement with his summer camp that he ran. And um, and uh, he was terminated because of it. The eight, it case went up to the Eighth Circuit a due process claim, and the court upheld his termination on grounds that he was engaged in misuse of university resources because of his summer camp. These days, these summer camps are very prevalent, and they're part of the contracts of the coaches, uh, the major sports coaches. They, it's a very significant part of the contract, and oftentimes. The at, at the University of Minnesota level, we're talking big time sports with million dollar contracts. The, the, the contracts with the big coaches, with the, the major revenue sports, and even the, the lesser sports, but basketball, football, um, hockey, men's hockey, women's hockey, and women's basketball, the, the big, the, the high profile sports here and elsewhere, the, especially at public institutions, there's always there's, uh, reluctance. 
uh, or some resistance, or both, uh, to give out big money contracts, although they have to, to compete. We know that these are these coaches at that level get million dollar contracts and the like, but nevertheless, the value of the contracts are, the amounts of the contracts are held down a little bit because they'll say, well, we're only paying him a million three or we're only paying her whatever it is. I guess we're paying him a million three, but we're paying her 700,000, right? Yesterday was equal women, equal payday for women, right? So, but whatever it is, the amount sounds staggering, and it is, but it's, it's competitive. I think the, at the university here, the coaches generally at the big sports are in about the second or third tier. There's 14 teams in the Big Ten, and they're like, well, you know, there's 10 teams that, that pay more than, than our teams do, and that's probably right as to the contracts themselves, the actual salaries, but what they get are these extra benefits. They get, as part of the deal, they'll get their own uh, radio show or TV show, and they get paid for that. And I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying that's the way it is. But the summer camps are a big deal because they get to run the summer camps under the imprimatur of the University of Minnesota. And they use Minnesota University facilities, and they use university resources, and they, and they use all the accoutrements of the University of Minnesota. So it really aids their summer camps. And they don't, they don't get any money from the university with that, but they, get, they make a lot of money through these summer camps. Well, back in those days, it was just the beginning of that concept, and it didn't work out well for the intramural director. Another ba a basketball case that some of you probably are familiar with, and this is a case of, uh, that made uh, worldwide, or at least national, get, get, attracted national attention, is B. Hagen versus International Intercollegiate Conference of Faculty Directors. That case was stemmed from the brawl at the barn. Is there anyone here who remembers that or knows what I'm talking about at all? Well, okay, a couple of people. Um, because we're a webcast, I can't ask you to contribute, but if I'm wrong, tell me. But this was late in the night, and Minnesota basketball was, at the college level was kind of dreary and not very good for a number of years. Uh, the, the University of Minnesota Gopher basketball team brought in a gentleman named Bill Musselman. Remember him, he later became a Timberwolves coach, real fiery leader and real adamant and aggressive and young man who was 31 at the time and was one of these kind of take charge, I'm gonna turn this program around, and he did. So what was kind of a dreary, desolate, a dreary program that drew five, 6,000 people at Williams Arena, wasn't a big deal, he didn't have a television contract, it just wasn't a real big deal, he turned it into a big deal. And, we, and, he, and the Gophers were very good. They won a Big Ten championship. They were nationally rated. They were up there in the top 10. And they, they became a, a national, a well-known national team. They sold out their games, 18,000. They only see 13,000 now because of a modification. They'd sell out Williams Arena. He had a television contract and it was a big deal. He turned around the program significantly. One way he turned around the program is he brought in a lot of new recruits who uh, some of whom perhaps were not um, uh, the best citizens, uh, but they were good basketball players. And this is a problem we've seen in other, you know, before and, and since. But uh, the Gopher basketball team uh, that year, this is 1972, was the defending Big Ten champions national team. I think they were rated fourth in the country. At the end of the, late in the season, around this time of the year, actually it was a little bit earlier in March, um, they were tied for first place with Ohio State. In those days, there was not a Big Ten um, uh, postseason uh, playoff like there is this tournament. There wasn't a tournament. And in those days, they didn't have 68 teams qualifying for this uh, the, the basketball tournament. You had to win your conference to get into the tournament, which consisted of 32 teams to get into the final four and all that. So winning the conference was everything. If you don't win the conference, you don't play anymore. This was the second to the last game of the season. The two teams were tied for first place, Ohio State and Minnesota. The game was played at Williams Arena, and there were 20,000 people there. The fire marshals they, they couldn't even keep the people out of there. It was a big game. The Gophers were losing late in the game by a couple of points. Um, and this was very late in the game. With less than a minute left, the Gophers were down by a few points. Ohio State had the ball. And this was before, incidentally, the, the rule, the 30-second 30 rule, 45-second rule, they, they could hold the ball back in those days without having to play against the clock. So Ohio State was holding the ball. They had the ball. And it looked like they were going to win. Well, there was a foul call, and the Ohio State center, Luke Whitty, who was an All-American center, was fouled and fell down in the free throw lane. And he was fouled and jostled um, and, and, and with about 35 seconds left to go. One of the goal for basketball players named Ron B. Hagen came over and gentlemanly like picked, extended his hand to help when he get up from where he was on the floor. And while he did that, he also extended his knee right into his brawl. Seen on national television. A brawl erupted. 
Ohio State players, Gopher players, fans. It looked like a the fans came out of the stands and went in the court, and it was a major brawl. There wasn't a lot of security. There was some, but the police couldn't hold them up, and the court was full of people, and things were being thrown, and punches being thrown. It was a brawl. It made the lead item the next day on the Walter Cronkite's five around here five thirty nightly news, and that was a big deal because in those days everyone watched Walter Cronkite, right? It made the front page of the New York Times. Probably the first time the uh, Gopher basketball team been on the front page of the New York Times. Well, they did come on and get on the front page about a generation later for some other reasons, uh, which we'll get to in a few minutes. Um, uh, it was a big deal, okay? Big, big deal, national deal. And it was kind of the predecessor of this. Uh, it, it wasn't a fan violence case because the fans, they weren't attacking the fans. But remember about 10 years ago when some NBA players went in the stands and attacked fans? This was sort of a predecessor of that. He didn't attack any fans, but it was sort of like, it was one of the predecessors of violence and sports and getting the fans involved and that kind of stuff. Well, Behagen was ejected, was suspended. The Gophers lost the game, by the way, and lost the championship. Um, Although that came later because they still had a couple of games left to play in the season. So the Gophers lost that game. And, you know, so absent the uh, Ohio State being upset, the Gophers were not going to win the championship. But there's still a couple of games left in the season. It was so possible that they could tie and win the championship. But B. Hagen was, um, was, um, was um, ruled ineligible because of that incident. Right? He then challenged that, and that was the lawsuit. Okay? That was the lawsuit, whether uh, whether Behagen could or couldn't, whether it was proper to um, to terminate him, uh, not terminate him, but make him ineligible. And that went all, uh, that was decided by Judge Earl Larson, federal court here in Minnesota. It was a due process case. Behagen's argument was, you can't just suspend me from the team or kick me off the team or make me ineligible just because, without giving me a hearing. It was a due process right to a hearing case. Back in those days, the early 70s, that was unheard of. Not just in college athletics, but in pro athletics and sports in general. The people who ran the, the organizations could make whatever eligibility decisions they wanted. The notion that someone could challenge an eligibility decision was unheard of. It just didn't happen. And one, another reason it didn't happen is the law hadn't been developed very, at that point. In the early 70s, the Supreme Court had its very first due process cases the right to a hearing when government for, against government action. And some of those early cases involved cutting people off for welfare benefits, cutting people off from a utility service, cutting people off from food stamps, denial of a government benefit on grounds that the people were ineligible, the recipients were ineligible. And the Supreme Court in a series of cases in the ninth, early 1970s held that under the due process clause, an individual is generally entitled to some kind of hearing before, they're, before they can be uh, denied government benefits that they'd already been receiving. And this case came on the heels of that, and the judge ruled that Behagen was, the, the argument that, that Behagen made is I should be allowed to play the rest of the season until I get a hearing. And the university's argument was hearing, what hearing? This is on television, everyone saw it, right? I mean, this is like Jack Ruby, you know? I mean, everybody saw it. It was on national television, it was played over again, slow motion, it was like watching the Zapruder film to mix a metaphor. What, what do you need a hearing for if everyone saw you what you did? Well, we as lawyers and others know that uh, sometimes the facts are not all, they seem to be some of these issues of motivation, there's issues of uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, degree of the severity of punishment and other factors that come into play in a hearing. And of course, there was even some questions about well, who had instigated. One of the arguments was the, uh, the Ohio State players had been using some racial epitaph. So there was facts that had to be found. And that's what Judge Larson said. We have to, there has to be a fact-finding hearing before you deny someone the right to play uh, college basketball, which is a right. Not a right, but a privilege, but he, he had the right to have a hearing beforehand. And that was the ruling in that case. And, and while I won't say it established it because it's only a district court ruling, it was a major case in the development of due process rights for college athletes and later pro athletes. And we see this all the time, the deflate case, deflate gate case with Tom Brady. Now these, the, the hearing process now is written into the contracts and the rules of the organizations. Back then, it was a matter of deciding as a matter of law and this case did that. Um, uh, I was uh, privileged enough to be involved in that case as, uh, as uh, Judge Larson's law clerk. So I was pretty familiar with the fact and I must've watched that film uh, 40 times. 
it, it, totally, it looked different. Every time you saw the film, you saw something different. But, uh, but uh, that was the uh, ruling in the case. Um, due process continued to uh, crop, crop up in Minnesota college basketball cases after the Behagen case. Oh, and so he ended. So Behagen was eligible. Gophers played out the season, but they and they, they won their next game, and then Ohio State uh, lost the game. So they back tied again for the champion for first place. The Gophers ended the season with Behagen back playing. Now remember he was reinstated. This all was real quick and junk and stuff. So Behagen was back playing, and the Gophers needed to win the last game of the season against Northwestern, which back then and still now was the doorman of the Big Ten, and they lost. Gophers lost the last game, were upset, uh, and uh, ended the season in second place in the Big Ten, didn't qualify for the, for the championship round. That's the uh, denouement of the uh, Behagen case. Behagen left school the next year, and uh, the team kind of deteriorated. Musselman left uh, under a cloud of uh, NCAA irregularities, uh, and the team was on suspension for a couple of years and went through all that kind of NCAA probation stuff. Musselman resurfaced again with the Timberwolves playing at the Target Center. Uh, later on, he was the Timberwolves' first coach. Um, Michael Thompson, most people do, a lot of people remember that name, Michael Thompson, the father of a, a well-known NBA player these days, Clay Thompson on the Golden State Warriors. Clay Thompson, for you basketball fans, along with Steve, Stephon Curry, uh, he's on the Golden State Warriors. That's, that Michael Thompson is his father, Clay Thompson. Michael Thompson was a stellar University of Minnesota gopher basketball player in the, in the uh, mid-70s. Right, when the Gopher team kind of rejuvenated itself, came from the Bahamas and was a uh, All-American player. In fact, Thompson became the number one selected draft choice in the NBA. He was the top player in the country that year, at least from a, a, a perspective, from a NBA professional perspective. He wasn't player of the year, but he was close to it. It's All-American, uh, undisputed All-American basketball player uh, with the with the Gophers. Well, he ran into a uh, a, a problem with an eligibility problem as well. He and other players were receiving or, or were called receiving quote extra benefits. Another uh, these days when you hear that term, you kind of think of something under the table. It was pretty petty in Thompson's day. They were getting extra basketball tickets. Each player, I think, it's got two or four tickets to give away to fans or family members or use what they want. Well, the Gophers were trying to help supplement the, 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 the this compensation of some of the players, so they'd give them extra basketball tickets, which they could sell. And again, the team was popular, and those tickets were worth a lot of money back then. They could sell them for 15 or $20, which was a lot of money back then. So Thompson and some other players, but Thompson was the main one, were getting extra benefits under the table stuff. There was never any allegation or proof that it was big money or other things, but it was small stuff like that, tickets, and there was a few other small things. He got extra shoes, extra apparel and things that he sold. Um, and some other players did it too, but he was the one that was caught. And, uh, and they ruled him ineligible for five games. That case was taken up by the university. The university supported Thompson in that case, and the university sued the NCAA to try to make him eligible because they said he was denied due process. The NCAA, the college uh, regulatory agency, ruled that he was ineligible for seeing his extra benefits, so the university challenged it. The, the university won in the lower court here in Minnesota. The district court here in Minnesota, the university won that case. Um, which is a, it's not a legal doctrine, but um, it's a point that I think uh, comes through in a lot of these sports cases. There's a lot of hometown cooking in these cases. And if you're a hometown team or a hometown player, uh, you have a significant advantage in the local court. And that's not just true here in Minnesota, it's true just about any place in the country, I think. Um, but I'll just leave it at that. The go for the the go. The university won that case, and the, the district court, the in federal court here in Minnesota, said Thompson was reinstated. However, that went up to the Eighth Circuit, sitting in St. Louis back then. The farther away you get, the less chance you have of winning. And the Eighth Circuit held that he was given due process. The Eighth Circuit said, unlike in the Behagen case, where they made a snap decision based on what happened on the court. The, there was some investigation done by the NCAA. They interviewed witnesses. And they found facts. They actually found facts. They just didn't say you're ineligible. They held some kind of cursory examination, not a full-blown adjudication, but the court said that was enough to at least satisfy due process. Thompson was held out for five games, 
And as a result of, and they lost three or four of those games. And they, and as a result of losing those three or four games, they did not win the Big Ten championship that year. They probably would have with him in there, but they didn't because he was ineligible. Um, one, fun, one more college eligibility case of, of, of note is Hall versus University of Minnesota. And this case involved another gopher basketball player, not a preeminent player, but a good solid player, Mark Hall. Mark Hall was the fifth or sixth man on another good gopher basketball team. After Thompson left, team deteriorated, they came back again. Early 1980s, the Gophers are again a championship caliber team. That team had Trent Tucker. Yeah, that Trent Tucker, the one is, is around here and does television Brian. Trent, Trent had a good NBA career. And the uh, star, that team also had, um, it was just after, but a couple of years earlier, they had Kevin McHale on those teams. And the star player, though, the 82 team was Randy Brewer, seven foot two Randy Brewer from Lake City, Minnesota. It was a very good team rated in the top 10 in the country. Mark Hall was either the second or third guard in the team. He kind of alternated. So he wasn't a key player, but he was an important player. He was sometimes the first man off the bench, sometimes he started. Um, uh, he was not doing well academically, which is an understatement, like not attending classes, right? And he was being, he was a basketball player and not a student. Because of that, he was put, he was, he lost his eligibility. He can't play on the team unless you're attending classes or going, at least going through the normal process. Um, so he was an academically ineligible player. He challenged that and sued in federal court in Minnesota. And Judge Miles Lord was the judge in that case. And Judge Lord ordered the university to reinstate him and make him eligible. Now, the university can't necessarily make someone eligible because it's kind of up to the NCA. But what Judge Lord said is you have to find an academic spot that he can at least satisfy. You have to create an environment that lets him succeed in academia. You do? Why? Well, Judge Lord said that this case raised, in his words, serious and troubling questions about the, quote, tug of war between academic and sports. It's not probably the first time that issue has been uttered, but it was one of the early cases that really started to raise this question about what, is, what are college athletics really about? Is it really about academics? Is it about sports? Are these student athletes? Or are these athletes sometimes, are these athletes and sometimes and hardly ever these days students in some schools? Okay. Now this was well before the one and done days. Those days players played for four years if they could remain eligible. But nevertheless, the, the crevices were being viewed or be, developing about this, uh, about the, um, the college athletic programs and the big schools, the division one schools, football and basketball mainly, and becoming, uh, becoming industries in themselves and becoming divorced from the academic institution. And the relationship between the teams and the academic institutions were kind of were somewhat limited to the names and the uniforms and, the, uh, and sometimes not too much academics. Not always, but sometimes. And, this, and, and Judge Lord noted that. And he made a comment in the case that this person, this, this player, was enticed here from his home in Massachusetts. He was recruited from Massachusetts Hall, was a East Coast basketball player. And Judge Lord said, the reason he came here to Minnesota was, quote, to be a basketball player, not a scholar. What Judge Lord was saying there, and it was a condemnation, and not just of the University of Minnesota, but college basketball in general, basically saying, you colleges bring these players in, oftentimes from afar, doesn't have to be from afar, and you don't give a whit about their academic progress. Sure, you want to comply with the minimal standards, but you're bringing them in to play sports, not to be scholars. And that kind of reverberates more and more as we see what college athletics has become and what college basketball has become. And what, especially with you know, the one and dones and so on and so forth, where the players have, are just putting in their time, if, if that, at colleges and moving on to the next level. So Judge Lord reinstated Hall, not on due process grounds, as in these other cases, but he reinstated him on the grounds that the university didn't live up to its promise to him to let him play basketball. They had to make it, they had to allow him to play basketball because that's what they brought him for. However, 
even though he was reinstated, things didn't work out well. He left the team in the middle of the year. They won the championship that, that year anyway. And Hall, unfortunately, died a few years later of a drug overdose. That was, again, a predecessor case for what we're seeing somewhat today in these academic scandals and irregularities that are being addressed by the courts in big-time college athletics. A couple of uh, other um, the college basketball-related cases, uh, both of which, uh, in the interest of the conflict of interest, I will disclose I was the attorney in both these cases, uh, the prevailing attorney. If I wasn't the prevailing attorney, I wouldn't have put him on here. I'm not going to wait put on cases I lost. <laughs> but uh, more college basketball uh, eligibility scandals. Okay? Now we go back and forward a few more years. Now we're in the late 1980s. The University of Minnesota's program, uh, football and basketball programs were under scrutiny, especially the basketball program and the football program, for all a myriad of alleged infractions. Some of them involved I improper recruiting, improper benefits, having of, of, uh, stu of uh, students' uh, academic records, and all kinds of other mischief. This preceded the Clem Haskins uh, writing the exams for students. This isn't that case, but it's leading up to it, okay? This was a, a panoply of irregularities at the University of Minnesota, which quite frankly, and I'm not in any way condoning them, were again, kind of small potatoes compared to what goes on at some other schools, or has gone on, but they got caught. That was one of the defenses was everybody does it, and you know how well a defense that is. Um, but but it was it was not major infractions. That's not to condone it, but it was a, but it was a number of them. And the university got caught. And of course, the University of Minnesota was one reason they got caught because they had these other problems that we just talked about. So they had a decade of these problems. Other schools did too, but Minnesota at least. Some people here claim that they were going to that, that the uh, college athletic establishment was picking on Minnesota. In a sense, they were, but uh, but uh, they were picking on it because they were easy pickings. So the uh, NCA did an investigation of these violations by the University of Minnesota. Back in those days, these NCA investigations were confidential and secret and not disclosed. If there was punishment, sanctions, they would announce the sanctions. They'd say, well, the team is being put on probation for two years, or they can't be on television, or they can't be in a bowl game, or they lose some scholarships. They'd say what the uh, punishment was, but they wouldn't tell you what it was for, because it was confidential. The student newspaper at the University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota Daily, thought that there should be some transparency, and they sued to get the report. They sued under the, the Friendly Data Practices Act. I say friendly because Minnesota has a pretty friendly data practice act, not as friendly as some other states, but they sued under the Data Practices Act seeking the NCA report. And they sued not the NCA, because the NCA was a subject to the Data Practice Act, they sued the university. The university said, well, don't, don't sue us. We didn't do the report in the daily through its uh, uh, outstanding lawyer, said, well, we don't care who did it, we care who got it. You've got a copy of it, don't you? Well, maybe, I don't know, we have to do some redaction too. Oh, redaction, huh? Well, we want to see the whole report. We don't want you to redact. Sound familiar, anybody? What goes around comes around, doesn't it? So the issue was, can the university, can the student newspaper, or anybody for that matter, because the data practice, because right? you know, it's to everybody, but can the media have access to one of these confidential, investigative reports. And if so, can they get the whole report? Does there have to be some redactions? Uh, what's, is there some filtration? How are, how are you gonna handle the identification of private data in the material? Um, and the like. And, and uh, the court held here, and it, it was a district court case, and, but uh, and, and then it went up to on, a, on, a, on appeal. But uh, the Minnesota, the Hennepin County District Court ruled in favor of the newspaper under the Data Practices Act and said, the, the, you know, it's a public institution. The difference was private. Public institution. They have the, they have public records there. They use public taxpayer money in part to work on this case to do the investigation. University personnel and university lawyers were paid lots of money worked on this case. This the public has a right to know it's in that report. So the university prevailed, and that was and there was another case that came a little bit after them. It was the first case we think. Um, well, I'll go even farther. It's a very, we know it's the first case that in which any of these copies, the NCA reports were ever made public. 
Until then, they were always, well, here's the, here's the result, here's the penalty, but we won't tell you why. This was the groundbreaking case. Shortly after this case, the University of Louisville had a bigger scandal with hush money payments and under the table payments and tennis shoe payments and the kind of things we're seeing now. But, um, and, 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 uh, and that case, uh, ordered that the NCA report be made public in that case, reciting and relying on this case. So the, this case, the Minnesota Daily case, and there were two of them, uh, the Minnesota Daily cases were the predecessor for all of these internal confidential uh, investigations at the college level being made public. So every time you read about or hear about some organization, some college being subject to investigation, the report is ultimately going to be made public and the reasons are going to be made public largely because of this case as a, a precedent for that um, uh, principle. Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about a few more cases. Should we talk about some college cases, uh, coaching cases? Yeah, let's talk about a few co co coaching cases. Um, college, high school coaches are subject to, uh, there, there's a lot of high school uh, uh, sports coach cases. Um, and they, the cases usually, or there's different genres, but one of the genres of cases in Minnesota is the termination of, the, of a high school coach. Now it's usually not done really as a quote termination, it's done as a non-renewal. High school coaches are on a year to year contract generally. They may have tenure as teachers, although these days many of them don't teach. In the old days, uh, the, you know, the, coach was a, uh, the coach was a teacher too, but uh, these days sometimes the coaches aren't even on faculty uh, or not in the school. But, most coaches do have tenure for the teaching, but they don't have tenure for their coaching. And that's true in all sports, football, baseball, hockey. And they're subject to all kinds of vicissitudes of their contract not being renewed. Sometimes it's because of poor performance, a string of bad seasons. Oftentimes it's because of another factor, and that's parental complaints or student complaints. Uh, that becomes a factor, and sometimes, sometimes there's community opposition. So for various reasons, coaches, they lose the ability to keep coaching, and that's the right that they want to maintain. Uh, and some coaches don't care. They walk away and say, fine, if you don't want to be a coach, I won't. I'll still teach. But some coaches have challenged the, their, their non-renewal, and they've based it on due process grounds, and they've also based it on some statutes. There's some particular statutes in Minnesota that address that, that were, that were um, legislated as a result of some of these coaching cases. But the general rule that emerges from these Minnesota coaching cases is that coaches are not protected by tenure in Minnesota. There is a stat, so the Coaches Association uh, and the Minnesota Education Association lobbied and got a statute passed. Um, um, it's 125-121, and it's kind of an odd statute for those who are engaged in any kind of employment or academic related work. The statute says that coaches are at will, employ, uh, work on an at will basis, even though they have a contract, and they can be terminated for, quote, any reason. Well, that's the basic old at will employment doctrine, isn't it? You can terminate someone for any reason or no reason at all. However, before a coach can be terminated or not renewed, they, they can request a due process hearing, which means they get notice and they can, have, uh, they can challenge the determination and have a hearing with evidence and testimony and whatever else goes into a hearing. However, since they're at-will employees, the hearing doesn't do them much good because the, the determination does not have to be, the, the determination or not renewal does not have to be based on any grounds. So it's kind of odd that a coach in Minnesota can challenge his or her termination or non-renewal, they get a hearing, but they have no grounds in which to win or prevail. So that statute is, that statute is kind of strange here in Minnesota. It kind of, it tries to amalgamate due process with at will, with contract law, and I don't think it does a very good job. And the, as a result, very few coaches are, go through the process and even fewer of them ever win those cases. And here's a few more examples in, our, in the material about coaches challenging their non-renewal and losing, notwithstanding their right to a due process hearing, which doesn't give them very much because there's no standard of cause required. Lots of insurance cases involving basketball and basketball injuries that are contained in the materials. Um, uh, I'll skip over a couple of them here. Um, let's see. Um, and... 
no? Let me just take about, talk about one case there. Um, one in one one injury case. There's a lot of injury cases. They say basketball is not a contact sport, but basketball is in, in a sense. And uh, there's injuries that occur. Uh, one of an interesting case is um, um, here's a couple of interesting cases when students are in, when players are injured. In the, in the Rochester case here, the Pumper versus uh, the Rochester School District case. Interesting. Here's a player who's injured when he slits when he while he's playing he's fouled goes off the court and is injured not by another player. It wasn't malicious. But he hurts himself by running into the bleachers, and the issue was, and, and, and the, the appellate court upheld the determination that the school was negligent because they didn't maintain the gymnasium in a safe condition. One of the arguments made in that case was assumption of risk. The school district, through its insurance company, said, "Well, when you're playing sports, there's an assumption of risk that you might get injured, and we're not going to insure someone for being injured in the, in the basketball." But in that case. It's problem and the cause of action wasn't the injury itself. It was the school district's failure to safely secure the playing court so that a player wouldn't fall off the court and get injured in the bleachers. Um, and today, and then assumption of risk was a little more popular defense now. Today, I'm not even sure where assumption of risk stands. The Supreme Court has really eviscerated it in, in, the, la in the last couple of uh, months. There have been an, an assumption of risk barely exists anymore as a doctrine. Uh, and to the extent it does, there's ways around it. And this case shows you one way around it where you say, okay, even if there's an assumption that there might be some injury in the game, the injury was caused by something that was not intrinsic to the game. It was an other outside factor. All right, we just about hit our time period here. So uh, uh, I'd be happy to entertain some questions, comments. This is the final four. I had to wait till yesterday or Monday to put this together. I had a different one initially, but we had to change that. So uh, what do you think here? Let's let's take a show of hands here for our final four. We're just gonna pre predict the winner, okay? Uh, everyone's back, it might be busted by now, but all right. Uh, everyone put your head down uh, on the table there. Don't look, no. All right, how many, the winner now, okay? How many think it's going to be Auburn? Yeah, okay, all right. All right, how about Virginia? So th they're the betting favorite, right? A little bit. Betting favorite, okay. They were the team that lost last year, remember the 16th seed? No. All right, so Virginia, we got about seven, eight votes there. Michigan State, our local team, not our local team, but the Big Ten team, okay. So, all right, about 14 there. And lastly, Texas Tech, my team, okay. Good luck. If they win, let's have a party, okay? All right. And we finished with a quiz. I got the one minute left, so let's do the quiz real quickly here. All right, this is a basketball quiz. Uh, what was the Gophers men's record in 1996-97? That was the Clem Haskins season. That's when they uh, went to the Final Four. Only time the uh, Gophers went to the Final Four. That was that great team. John Thompson, Sam Jacobson, uh, Bobby Jackson, Ernest Harris, Courtney Thomas. Um, Don't anticipate it here. All right, they're right. You got it right. I've given this presentation a couple of times recently, and no one's got that right. Well, it was a 31 and four. No, it's 30. They're right. Their record that year was zero and zero. That's the team that's record was wiped out because of the Clem Haskins, Jan Ganglehoff writing the papers case. The banners were removed, and their record has been removed from the record book. Just like Winston Smith. In, in, the, in the 1984, George Orwell's 1984, Winston Smith, the protagonist, remember his job was in 1984, he was in the ministry, he was in the in ministry of just information. His job was to remove from history the names of people who were adverse or enemies of the state. Okay? A gopher team doesn't exist. It never happened. Zero and zero. Right, how many times did the women's gopher play in the final four? Anywhere, hazard a guess there? Okay. Well, the answer is one. That was the win Lindsay Whalen year, 2004. That was the only time the Gophers, and they that was the year they qualified for the Final Four, and they lost in the semifinals. To whom? Anybody remember that? Who they lost to? Ever hear of a team called Connecticut? It's the beginning of the Connecticut dynasty. Um, who holds the men's single season scoring record? Thompson, we talked about Thompson. Brewer, we talked about Dewar. Jacobson, McHale. The answer is, all right, it's Michael Thompson. Who holds a single season women's record? That's an easy one, right? Sure, it's Rachel Bannum, it's not Lindsay Whalen, and she holds a Big Ten record a few years ago. Who is the longest tenured University of Minnesota men's basketball coach? Okay, Clem Haskins there. 
John Kunla. Kunla was the coach of that old Laker team, the championship Laker teams, and coached here. He was the coach of Lou Hudson's team. Kunla was the coach for the uh, uh, Gophers for a number of years. Uh, uh, Cook, L.J. Cook, for whom Cook Hall is named over the university, or Dr. H.L. Williams. Right? Again, pretty easy. The answer is Cook, coach for 29 years. And uh, uh, how about Williams, though? Williams Arena? Never coached basketball. Dr. Williams was a football coach at the turn of the last century. Never coached football. I mean, no, I'm sorry. Never coached basketball. I'm sorry, he's a football coach. He never coached basketball. He'd roll over in his barn if you saw Williams Arena today. All right, but the, so, the, so the basketball stadium here is named after a football coach. Go figure. And uh, for you small college fans, we talk a lot about big college basketball and the, the industry that basketball has become. But uh, basketball is played at different levels. The MIC, that's our Minnesota Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, Division Two, sometimes even Division Three. What's they're celebrating their hundredth year? This is the hundredth anniversary of the MIAC. That's McAllister, Hamlin, who else? St. Olaf's. Carl, yeah, some of them Carl and probably, right? Yeah, the smaller schools are just celebrating their hundredth year this year. And what school has won the most men's basketball titles in the Mayak? Not too far from here, St. Thomas. The Tommies, 33 times. So one third of all those titles have been won by the St. Thomas. That's a good number to end our discussion with today. One third is a good lawyerly like number for you contingency lawyer people. Okay, thank you very much for having me. I'll see you maybe in three years for the women's final four.